Hello, everyone, and welcome back to an all new episode of the Financial Confessions. I am, I know I say this a lot, but I have to give extra emphasis this time. Incredibly excited for this episode because it is probably the most hotly requested topic in terms of the intersection between finance, media, pop culture, our daily lives, social media, basically everywhere we go, this has become a more and more prevalent topic for both better and worse. I am talking about MLMs, pyramid schemes, and basically all of the other get rich quick stuff that you're seeing both on your Instagram feed and also probably in all kinds of series and documentaries and exposés. It's something worth considering that despite the pandemic having such an enormous economic toll, it also was a context in which these schemes, which many people on some level know are not legitimate and don't lead to success for most people, managed to thrive. And it is particularly that resilience in popularity, even through a devastating economic downturn, that made me want to have an expert on to talk about what these kind of schemes are, why they continue to be so popular, and maybe how to become even better at not only avoiding them ourselves, but also helping people we might know and love not fall into them themselves or get out once they're already in. And before we hop into our interview with today's guest, I want to thank our sponsor, Avast, for supporting today's episode of TFC. Avast's new all-in-one solution, Avast One, helps you take control of your safety and privacy online. So learn more about Avast One at avast.com. My guest today just happens to be an expert on all of that. He is a professor of marketing at the College of New Jersey, and his name is Dr. Bill Keep. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Um, So as I mentioned, you have a class specifically on these subjects. Can you tell us a little bit about it and sort of how you got into this space in the first place? Sure. Um, Well, I think the class focuses mostly on what I would call trust-based fraud. So Ponzi schemes, of course, um, and uh, multi-level marketing style pyramid schemes, which I've been involved in uh, since about 1996, was the first time I was involved in a case. I was then a professor at the University of Kentucky, and the Department of Justice came to the business school to ask for some help to prosecute a couple who were running a scheme and this is a little bit unusual, and it was criminal prosecution. Mm. The couple went to prison for 10 years. Wow, what made it criminal? It's a choice, actually, on the prosecutors. The prosecutor can choose. The DOJ has a choice. The FTC does not. The FTC can only bring a civil case. They can recommend it to the DOJ, um, but the DOJ can choose. Do we want to go uh, civil or criminal? And, and there are different conditions, and I'm not a lawyer, but there are some differences. So when you were brought into the case, you were sort of brought in as an expert? Yeah, I was a a fairly young professor at the time, and um, they came to the business school and said they were looking to prosecute this pyramid scheme, and I said, I don't know what a pyramid scheme is. And he said, well, they say they're doing retailing. Well, I was the retail expert at Kentucky, taught retailing for many years, and I said, well, I can definitely tell you if, if they're doing retailing or not. And of course, they weren't. Mm. Um, you know, like uh, pyramid schemes in general have little or no actual retailing to the public. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, so then I started getting phone calls. I was in some private cases, a uh, case between Procter & Gamble and Amway. I was in some state cases. I've worked with the FTC, the SEC, mm-hmm. um, and have a couple of private cases right now. So are all MLMs pyramid schemes, uh, and how do they differ? That's a really good question, and I certainly have uh, colleagues in the, in, among uh, MLM critics who would s- answer that by saying yes, um, they're all. I have not said that uh, because um, I'm an academic, I like to see data, and this is a notoriously opaque industry. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a very, very hard time getting data. We do know that, um, for example, in the case of AdvoCare, uh, that had operated for 25 years. Um, and finally the FTC shut it down. So we know that a what looks like an illegit- or a legitimate MLM can operate for many years and actually be operating a pyramid scheme. Now, what I'm personally, and I, we've done a lot of, we've done videos, articles, all kinds of things on the subject of MLMs, and what I still feel that I don't fully understand is what really separates an MLM from being legitimate? Like, I think, I mean, Amway's still around unless I'm mistaken. Amway is around. Um, and I think that uh, 
let me just touch on Amway specifically for a moment, and then I'll go back to your question. Uh, Amway is the only company that was that faced a pyramid scheme charge with the FTC and defended themselves successfully. Successfully. Well, but so how are some? And Amway is just one example. There are many. I, you know, Mary Kay still exists and things like that. What separates the ones which are able to operate for so long successfully and the ones which j get labeled a, a pyramid scheme and go out of business? Well, the prosecution is at the discretion of the prosecutors, of course. Um, and, and, you know, in a sense, if, if choosing to prosecute a case is almost like being a policeman and deciding which speeding car you're going to stop on the highway, mm. right? You're not going to stop them all. Um, and it's too resource intensive. Um, these cases can take years to prosecute sometimes, sometimes not. Sometimes they'll fold right away. Um, a, a, the case of Burn Lounge took seven years. Uh, went through the appellate court. So uh, it, it's a prosecutorial decision, will you go after this company or not? Sure. Um, the, what we know distinguishes them is that um, multi-level marketing companies um, that have little or no uh, consumer demand beyond the distributors themselves have been successfully prosecuted. Now, that doesn't mean that all the ones that could be prosecuted have been prosecuted. Right. It just means that when we look at the ones that were successfully prosecuted, one of the things they had in common, a key thing they had in common, uh, was that they did not have, they could not demonstrate consumer demand for their products beyond the distributors themselves. The other thing they always have in common is deception in terms of maybe what the product would do or how much money you could make. So misleading product and income claims has been uh, systemic to this industry since the 1940s. Now, so, something that has always confused me is there have to be elements of these MLMs that could just cease to happen from inception if we change the regulation around some of these things. Yeah, it's, you know, we as citizens, and, and I'm including myself in this, even though I've been looking at this industry for a long time, we don't always understand what gets turned into a law and what doesn't and how laws get prosecuted. So, for example, and I'll, I'll draw a parallel here, um, there is no um, law against insider trading. There is no law against pyramid schemes, right? The law that has been established is case law. Mm. So in other words, there's no piece of legislation that defines insider trading or piece of legislation that defines a pyramid scheme. Uh, we might wish there was, and there have been times in the past when there have been legislations introduced uh, way back to the 70s in the case of pyramid schemes, uh, but it, it, no law has ever been passed. Now, the industry has been trying to push a law that would essentially mean that the only people that they need to sell to are their own distributors, which would be contrary to 30 years of case law. Mm. Something we see a lot in MLMs um, are overlaps, sometimes just sort of figuratively, but sometimes quite literally with cults. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't know all of my Nexium fans out there, but I mean, aside from the fact that it sort of operated itself as an MLM, it also, you know, the, the cult leader got his start in other well-established MLMs. Um, and we see that a lot of the psychology around the two seem to line up and people who get out of MLMs, you know, often will refer to themselves right. as having been in a cult. Can you explain a little bit uh, about that particular aspect of the psychology and the success of them? I can, I can do a little bit of that. I don't want to pass myself off as a cult expert. Um, and I was tangentially uh, involved in the Nexium and that we were, I was about to go to court against him when he fled to Mexico. Um, so a celebrity is in our midst. <laughs> but um, the uh, uh, the we know, and, and I used the term earlier, a trust based scheme. Mm -hmm. um, we know that uh, you can use the term affinity marketing, warm markets. Um, we know that we try to find something uh, a, a shared value, whether it is uh, economic situation, um, having a baby, um, hours got cut cut at work. Um, the whole whole range of things uh, where we will capitalize on that connection and then we will reinforce this through not just the person that connected to you, but everyone else as well. Right. 
Uh, one of the very deceptive aspects here is the conveyance of the notion that there is a path to success and that it's knowable. Um, and so you will hear that if you just do these things, if you follow the, 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 the path that I went and I'm the, I'm the successful example, you too will be successful. That message in itself is deceptive. Right. I mean, to be fair, though, it somewhat feels like a bit of a microcosm of the American dream when you look at the stats. I mean, the idea that, you know, when we have fairly low class mobility compared to other developed nations, the idea that there's this path to success seems pretty anchored in our culture, would you say? I think that's exactly right. Yeah. Um, so what do you think in terms of so obviously, as I mentioned in the intro, we've seen these things gain in popularity, not just after the pandemic and during the pandemic, but also during a flourishing of a pretty robust anti-MLM movement um, of what, you know, of which we in which we occasionally participate. How do you kind of see the cognitive dissonance between the information and the popularity of how bad these things are, mm -hmm. you know, becoming so widely available and then becoming even more successful? Yeah, I think, first of all, um, in the United States, they aren't becoming more successful. They're becoming more plentiful. Right, sorry. Um, but they're not becoming. The data, according to the industry's data, and like I said, this is a, a very opaque industry, but according to the industry data, um, as a percentage of U.S. retail sales, uh, uh, multi-level marketing has actually been declining. Mm. Uh, and um, I, I, I have put out a couple of short pieces on that, um, and the industry has not refuted them. Um, and so we believe that the industry is, is up against headwinds in the United States right now, and we believe that the anti-MLM anti uh, movement has been uh, a, a real part of that. It's not the only part of it, but, it, but it's been an important part of it. Um, and a number of them have, of course, reached out to me and others. Uh, so I think that, you know, the industry isn't as healthy as it portrays itself to be. Mm. But where it is healthy is internationally. Uh, the first thing, if you're going to develop one of these schemes, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to go internationally. And you're going to do it for two reasons. First, you're going to do it because um, there's a whole market out there and their regulatory environment is probably even more... Um, ineffective than ours. And the second thing is, it, it sounds like it's more legitimate. We're now in 10 countries or eight countries right. or whatever. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're scamming people in 10 different countries. Exactly. Um, you know, one thing that I, I have noticed in particular over the past two years that seems like a, a pretty interesting overlap is so, you know, in the time of the pandemic, we've seen a pretty incredible proliferation of pseudoscience, of dubious health claims, of, you know, alternative medicines um, that are no such thing. Um, and a lot of that dovetails really nicely with the MLM movement. We recently did a video where we talked about specifically essential oil and, you know, faux health MLMs. Can you speak a little bit about that subgenre of MLM in particular? Yeah, it's it's very interesting. Um, uh, and I'm going to make a little bit of an, an analogy here. Um, when we had our housing crisis, uh, to some extent, the housing crisis was the result of the mortgage initiators going from protecting buyers to facilitating sellers. Right. And 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 and, and when we um, securitized mortgages, that allowed for that switch. And the reason I mention that as an analogy is because. When you decide to become a distributor for an MLM company, you take on a dual role. You must keep purchasing or you won't be eligible for income. Mm. So the MLM locks you in. The irony of this being capitalism and free enterprise is that when you join an MLM, you actually leave the marketplace for those products and you, you commit yourself to that company's products only. Mm. right? Because you, you're gonna have to spend that money every month, right? You really, or whatever the requirement is. But at the same time, the only way you're going to get successful is when you put your seller's hat on. Right. And when you put your seller's hat on, what makes you want to uh, pursue that income is the notion that this is the most wonderful product you've ever heard of. So I'm going to get, I'm going to convey that to my friends. It was conveyed to me. I'm, I bought in. I'm going to convey that to others. And so we begin to overstate the qualities of the product to the point of just flat out lying. Right. right? Curing cancer, treating autism, 
outrageous, uh, untruthful things being said by thousands of people, all in the effort to pursue income. Do you feel, and this is like a bit more of an existential question, but especially as an academic, as a subject matter expert who, you know, even in some of these questions goes out of your way to, you know, narrow the field in which you can really claim expertise, do you feel um, overall optimistic or pessimistic about the Internet's um, proliferation of information with a simultaneous flattening of expertise? Because I feel like that is a big contributing factor to MLMs as well, especially in that space. You know, that's a really good way to put it. And it's a very interesting question because I think that, you know, we um, uh, in academia, of course, I think have been struggling since the Internet um, with, as if we're competing against it. You right. Know, in, this, in, in exactly the same mode you're talking about. Um, my students are self-assured that they can go out and find whatever they need on the internet, whether it's true or not, right? Right. And so that's exactly what's happening. Um, uh, it's the internet is a very uncaring place, right? Um, but yet we go there a lot. Sure. Um, and so there's a sort of contradiction between wanting that connection and even wanting to trust the connection emotionally mm -hmm. and then intellectually knowing that this is a swamp. Do you feel that, this is a two-part question, but do you feel that the disclaimers that social media, and I feel like it's not a sufficient attempt, but that social media platforms are starting to put on potentially dubious or misleading information, do you think that those um, are helpful in a, you know, on aggregate? And then secondly, do you think those sorts of warning labels should be put on um, promotions and content about MLMs? Yeah, most MLMs will use some disclosure, um, and I know so the social media uh, um, outlets are also. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission has used a, a notion called net impression, hmm. uh, which means um, it, the, dis the disclosure doesn't mean much if all the other messaging is in the opposite direction. Right. And so that's, that's uh, one aspect of it. Uh, and I also think that, you know, the, the trick to MLM is the personal connection. So if I say to you, you know, you, you know, you're such a bright young lady and I know that there are still things you want in life and I've got, uh, you know, a, uh, an opportunity for you. It's just not for everybody, but it's it, it's a good opportunity for you. Um, and I start building that up for you, even though I'm going to show you data that's going to show most people can't do this successfully. I'm going to convince you that you can. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so how how does one, and this will kind of get us into a lot of our audience questions, how does one fight against it and protect themselves against it for themselves, but also for the people? I mean, even as much as I talk about them, I have right. family members who've gotten into MLMs. I think we all, we all have, I think. At this point. <laughs> um, the, I mean, the easy answer is to say just walk away from it. Uh, the the, the People won't walk away from it, at least not everyone will, but the easy answer is to, is to say it. We know for sure that um, your probability of, of success is very, very low. And we also know that the people um, who have been successful continue to be successful, meaning there isn't a lot of room at the top. Right. Right? And so um, if uh, I use the term top earner persistence, if top earners persist in an MLM, and they do, then in fact, what is the probability of you achieving that level? And how do people achieve it? Also opaque. So in other words, the industry will give you a single answer to every question about how do people get successful, right? They, um, they achieved it uh, because of hard work, right? I believe that's not true. I believe that hard work is not correlated to success in the MLM industry. Or in America. Sorry, continue. <laughs> or in America. Now, <laughs> if you see someone who worked hard and is successful, then that doesn't mean it was causal. 
or it doesn't mean that in every environment, if you did the exact same thing that person did, you'd be successful too. Right. But the message from the MLM is exactly as I described, that you see these people up on stage, or you see these people with these lifestyles, that's duplicatable by you. Sometimes the message is, it's duplicatable by everybody. Right. Clearly not true. Right, even just statistically makes no sense. It makes no sense. Um, but I do think that, and this goes back to your earlier point about social mobility, because I am someone who did um, achieve social mobility. Uh, I do think that um, our social mobility is pitiful. Um, and, you know, as I'm sure you know, our income inequality here is now as unequal as it was in the 1920s. It's never been that bad. Um, uh, I have concerned college students, um, you know, and um, our, we have a whole generation of people who are wondering how do I get what it is that other, you know, the other generations have gotten or what do I want. Now, sure, we're all aspirational and we may not get everything we want. That's fine. But we have to be able to see some paths. Right. I similarly um, changed social class and in doing so have become even more convinced that it is not possible for the vast majority of people in terms of the number of things that have to go right in order for it to happen. Um, and we see that all the time in terms of, you know, I, I think it's more than half the country, slightly more than half the country doesn't have enough to cover a $500 emergency in cash. You know, they have to put it on cards, so forth. Um, so that means that even a huge part of, you know, ascending in class is just nothing bad happening for a long stretch of time, um, which is something that even the hardest working person can't control for. Um, but part of what I think makes these MLMs so you know, persistent is the fact that their ethos and their mythology is 100% tied into the broader, you know, sort of American mythology. Well, I mean, it is. And and um, they have wrapped themselves up in that, you right. know, Amway, the American way, free enterprise um, is promoted uh, um, within the MLM industry all the time. Uh, yet, like I said, when you really look at it, uh, it isn't free enterprise. Uh, first of all, um, you're buying in to commit yourself as a customer. And second of all, um, you are not an entrepreneur. You have no control over the product. You have no control over the price. You, you have no control over the, the primary promotional messages. Right. All you can do is try to get other people to believe what you believe. And on that note, I want to take a quick pause and once again thank today's episode sponsor, Avast. As a digital first media company, and as you can tell from today's episode, digital safety is incredibly necessary in all forms and is something that is extremely important to us here at TFD. And today's sponsor, Avast, has been a global leader in cybersecurity for more than 30 years and is trusted by over 435 million users. Avast empowers you with digital safety and privacy no matter who you are, where you are, how you connect, or your budget. And you know how much we love talking about staying within budget. Avast One offers both free and premium options. And something that you may not know about me is that my husband is actually, his entire career is in digital safety and online security. And that man is constantly coming after me for not protecting myself online. Now to you know his credit, I definitely have upped my game uh, in terms of protecting myself online. And Avast is fantastic for that. But Avast also has a ton of different options for the types of services they provide. They have antivirus protection, they have data breach monitoring, and they have, even for people who like me, tend to load up their laptops with tons of unnecessary stuff, uh, PC speed up, which optimizes the background activity of your apps in order to speed up your PC. And all of this is to say that no matter what you're doing online, it is incredibly important to be protecting yourself and offering your digital experience the highest level of safety possible. And I can personally attest that Avast One is incredible for that. So learn more about Avast One at avast.com. And we'll link you guys to that in the description or the show notes. Well, on that note, though, it is it has quite a lot of similarities to organized religion. Um, <laughs> And we, so we recently filmed a video talking about some of the overlaps between um, some organized religions and um, MLMs and other financial schemes because they, you know, do tend to proliferate in certain churches. Um, can you speak a little bit about that connection? Yeah, uh, it's, it's fairly common to see um, a religious theme 
We've seen it both in MLM style pyramid schemes and financial pyramid schemes, often called gifting clubs. Can you talk about what a gifting club is? Sure. A gifting club is um, me inviting a bunch of friends around and I say, you know, things are tough, you know, but, you know, I've gone into something where if you put in 1500 bucks and you go and get a few more people to put in 1500 bucks um, uh, within three steps or whatever, uh, you'll walk away with 6000 8000 whatever the amount is. Um, it's a pure money transfer scheme. Mm-hmm. Um, and naturally, the bulk of the people are still at the bottom who have put their money in and haven't gotten any money. Um, and these gifting clubs date back decades. Wow. Um, so, sorry, you were saying the we do see overlap between... Yeah, there's been a religious uh, theme, and you'll hear people speak from the stage, you know, uh, thanking God, thanking their, their faith for causing them to be successful in an MLM context. Um, they talk a lot about family. They talk a lot about praying. Um, and so we have, again, we're trying to bring in the distributor into our world. Mm. And that means they... Um, need to not be as much in their old world. And that's why we end up also seeing divorces, uh, family members not talking to each other anymore, uh, those kinds of things, because we're going to bring them into our world of belief um, and faith in religion and faith in what this person's telling you from the stage aren't too dissimilar. Now, as I mentioned in the intro, this has been incredibly highly requested. So we have a a substantive list of audience questions that I will um, hop into. So this one is interesting. Is it possible or is it such a thing for an an ethical MLM to exist? I think it is possible. I wrote a piece that was in CNNBC uh, a few years ago. Um, you would have to structure it a little differently than what we're seeing. All the MLMs that I'm aware of now follow an endless chain scheme recruitment pattern. Uh, Could you limit that um, uh, so that recruitment wasn't the main emphasis and that you were actually doing what we used to call in the old days uh, is direct selling. The, The Direct Selling Association likes to call that, use that term now, but in fact, the Direct Selling Association is simply representative of the MLM industry. Okay. Um, and not what we would say old school Avon. Um, but yes, to, to go back, could it be ethical if it was structured properly and if it was transparent enough? I think it could be. And in that case, you're talking more about like a door-to-door salesman type thing. Yeah, party plan also uh, can be very popular. There is a social aspect to getting together um, People have been selling to friends and family member many things for a long time. You know, your cousin does your car insurance or something right, like right. that, right? Uh, a friend is a real estate agent, you know, those kinds of things. So, so there has been, and there's nothing wrong with that component. Um, but first and foremost, you must actually be moving the product or service. Like people must be the actual consumers of it. Yeah, we need to have people who, who don't have a vested interest in getting other people. Um, in uh, to to become distributors themselves, is it always unethical to buy a product from someone you know who's in an MLM? Is that just sort of like enabling them? Yeah, I uh, I'm not comfortable labeling that as unethical because I think we all do things for people we care about and we sure. think we're being helpful. But I think enabling is the right term there. Mm. Um, the you know the. When you become a distributor initially, you you have a great deal of hope. Um, That's why you did it. Um, And so, um, you know, if my niece or nephew came to me and said, you know, Uncle Bill, well, they wouldn't come to me because they know what I do. But if if they did, um, you know, you're going to have that inclination to want to be helpful. Um, But it, it won't go away because they need to persist. And in the end, they need to recruit. One of the things actually on that note that I wanted to ask, so one of the, in my opinion, one of the thing that, one of the things that makes it such a resilient industry comparatively is the fact that it can be very difficult to differentiate and very blurry to differentiate between someone who's a victim of an MLM and someone who's sort of a predator of an MLM. And especially as you get towards the top, you know, we've watched these documentaries where you have people who've made quite a lot of money. They're not the founders, they're not the owners of the company, but they've made quite a lot of money by duping and, you know, exploiting other people. Right. 
how does that, how do you kind of determine, and I don't think it should be a, a line where we separate people, but at what point does our response and our sort of uh, obligation to people become different based on um, where they are in the chain and what they're doing? Yeah, I think that's a good question. And when we look at multi-level marketing companies, we will see a layer of recruiters that could care less about you as a person, right? They're just good at this, right? Right. Um, and so, um, I, in from my mind, that's where the line uh, is drawn. The people who um, have have connected with their family and friends, um, I want to call them victims, even though they're also recruiting their family and friends. They're pursuing an opportunity. We know for sure that 90, 95%, once we include expenses, are gonna be in a financial loss position. Sure. They're never gonna make the income that, that they were pursuing. Um, that top layer, I would call those predators. Uh, they don't really care, and, and in, case, they just, they, in, case, uh, in cases, they just move from one ammo home to another. Put those people in jail. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> I tried, actually. <laughs> Ooh, this is a really good question. Um, why have MLMs so effectively targeted the Spanish-speaking community? Uh, I think uh, because that community um, uh, has um, fewer ready options, mm -hmm. economic options. Um, it's more, it's tight knit. It's among themselves. There are people among that a community, of course, who are undocumented. Um, uh, there, it, it's a community that's very faith based, um, and I think that it really lends itself. Um, if you uh, uh, read or heard much about the the Herbalife situation, and well, when Bill Ackman uh, uh, did the short against them, um, uh, there was a, a whole section there on the uh, Hispanic community. Uh, so I think that they're a community that. Uh, thinks that, you know, uh, that they are prepared to work hard um, and that they hear that this is uh, the requirement to be successful here. They're prepared to do that. Um, uh, but we're, again, talking about trust-based recruitment, uh, a Hispanic person recruiting a Hispanic person recruiting a Hispanic person. I mean, it seems like whether it's a religious group or military spouses or the Hispanic community, we're, uh, Latino community, we're, we're sort of in a situation where anytime there's a tight knit group of people with fairly limited options in many cases, depending on the given situation, um, those are going to be the prime targets. I think that's right. I think that, you know, we, uh, I mean, you, you uh, have shared, a, and I listened to some of that uh, about your own path and, and mine too, where I, uh, reached a point with my wife um, having been married so young that we just we just didn't know where we were going to go. Right. The path was just really uncertain. You have two problems. First of all, you got to make sure you pay your bills this month. And the second problem is how am I going to change my situation? Right. And the MLM presents itself as a solution to both. Mm. And it isn't. Um, so one of the questions, we got a lot of questions specifically about the stay-at-home mom aspect of MLMs. Um, so I'm sure this is a probably a difficult question to answer, but I'd love to hear your take on it. How can we talk about the need uh, and address the need for alternatives in areas where it feels like an MLM or nothing for stay-at-home moms? Yeah, you know, um, when we were young parents, um, we complained about how little our culture seemed to care about that problem. Mm. And now we're grandparents. <laughs> and same conversation. Right. So Probably slightly worse. <laughs> yeah. So here we have, uh, we, I mean, nothing strikes you as more important as those very first year, years with your child, uh, both for your own, uh, uh, you know, uh, connection and also that sense of responsibility. Right. And so, um, you know, we need to do a much better job socially in trying to open up opportunities for part-time employment. The, the good thing, the good news is that there are, of course, um, more flexibilities in terms of working remote, et cetera. Um, but uh, that doesn't make up for the gaps that people may have in training or finding those opportunities uh, when there are so many um, predatory uh, um, messaging going out 
so much messaging going out that uh, making money at home, et cetera. The Federal Trade Commission is going to reopen its business opportunity rule, which it shamefully, in my view, um, uh, excluded uh, the MLMs from that rule. Um, it, it, they won't say it the way I said it, because uh, I know they won't, because they told me they wouldn't. Uh, but um, in 2011, when they uh, put, promulgated that rule, uh, there was a, in leading up to that, the MLM industry had a concerted national campaign against the FTC, including them. And the FTC, uh, in my view, folded and excluded them. Um, they are going to, they've reported that they're going to start um, soliciting information. So what I would say, if when this happens, that we all write to the FTC um, because we need to be concerned about um, scams, MLMs that are scamming people, but others as well, when all these people want to do is be good parents. Would you say as a rule of thumb that a stay-at-home mom who feels that she has extremely limited employment options um, and is considering an MLM, that she is better off remaining unemployed than joining an MLM? Yes. Uh, uh, and I've written a couple of pieces, uh, you can make more money um, working part-time at minimum wage. I mean, actually make the money. Right. I mean, one of the, the stunning aspects of an MLM that people don't talk about is most of the people who generate one or more sales for an MLM company make nothing, zero. They do not make a commission on those. There's no direct commission for selling. Mm. And so um, I would much rather see uh, someone, you know, work on, you know, their own, into, you know, focus on a smaller set of skills and then find a part-time employment that will help you use those skills uh, to sort of build. Um, I think there are opportunities out there to do that. Um, but it, it does take a, a bit of a plan, and y you have to be a little bit patient. This is not going to make you wealthy in a year and a half. Well said. Um, so one of the things um, that uh, so many people are asking is, how do you help a loved one get out? What do you say to them? Yeah. Um, uh, it's really hard. I mean, I, I've got an email, uh, I've, I've kept it for a long time, of this fellow who hasn't spoken to his mom for years. Um, and, um, you know, in court cases and depositions, I've read about divorces, et cetera. I, I think that the best thing you can do um, is to simply say that that's not something you yourself can participate in and that it, you have to... Uh, draw a line if they are doing something that affects your, in, you know, your, your household finances. I mean, there are examples where uh, people in MLMs have been encouraged to um, lie to their uh, spouse about uh, money being spent, to use a credit card that the spouse doesn't know about, those kinds of things. So at a minimum, you have to be able to talk with, I'm going to assume this is a very intimate kind of a situation, you know, not just a friend, but you know, a partner, a close friend, a spouse. So, at a minimum, you have to agree to limit the financial harm, and that means keeping track of everything being spent. Um, and the other thing is, I would encourage uh, is just to simply have them keep a diary. How much time did you just spend today on your MLM, right? And let that data speak to them over time. It, you may not know the answer to this because it is a legal question, but what recourse does a person have if, let's say, I'm, you know, my husband behind my back um, depletes 100% of our life savings to an MLM? What recourse do I have? Right. Well, it depends. Um, MLMs have increasingly uh, uh, required people to um, agree to uh, go into some sort of arbitration or something if they have a complaint against them. In other words, to try to forego a class action against them. Um, one of the things that, that you can do is to participate in a class action. So right now I'm an expert in a case in California where um, 
they have identified a class um, and they are bringing a pyramid scheme uh, a charge, a, a suit, complaint against this company and um, they intend to recover some money. Uh, you have to be careful in class action. There are class action lawyers that I wouldn't want anybody to work with um, and, and there are class action lawyers that I've refused to work with um, and, and there are class action lawyers who know what they're doing. Uh, now class action lawyers get a, put a lot of money up front and they get a lot of money in the end. They're going to get it probably a third or whatever. Um, but that is a way um, and, and it is possible. It takes a while. You're not going to get that money back right away. Um, but that is a way. Um, but this is an industry that hires Harvard-trained lawyers all the time. And when they go global, they hire some of the finest international law firms in the world to represent them. How shameful to represent them. Deal drugs. You'd do less harm to the community, honestly. Um, okay. Uh, why are women so often targeted to join more than men are? Well, um, I think that uh, because of life, the life stages uh, um, uh, of, uh, that women might go through, I think they might find themselves in a situation where they would just like to make a little extra money here and there. They may, they may be um, you know, a, a, a new mom or something like that. I, and I, I want to be a little bit careful here, um, but men aren't very helpful to men. That's true. I thought you were going to be like, because women be shopping. <laughs> no. <laughs> w women are helpful to each other or yeah. try to be. Now, in this case, it's not helpful. Yeah. Uh, but there is among um, in my, in my experiences, uh, it, there's just a, a, um, a warmth uh, uh, of sharing among women um, that, you know, that... It, I don't believe exists uh, in in most male to male relationships. Even oh, though I think most male to male relationships can be very satisfying. They can, although when you look at the numbers on aggregate past a certain age, men don't really have friends. They have very few statistically, and the ones they do have are typically through their wife in some capacity. Um, so, I mean, I think just in terms of like not having that many people to sell to, that's also probably a contributing factor. Women tend to have much larger friend groups. Right, I think that's right, and I. You know, men tend to be competitive, and if a man, uh, uh, you know, wanted to talk to me about a, a, a business deal, I'd be highly skeptical. Yeah. Although, I don't know if this is an MLM model or an affiliate model, but all of those, like, um, very, like, male audience podcasts are all selling those, like, you know, brain supplements and vitality powders and things like That's that. That's true. And, and the newest thing that is male-centric, or at least mostly male-centric, I understand, is NFTs. Oh, my God. We have to... <laughs> sorry, awful. do you have anything to say about MF, NFTs? Let's pivot to that. Yeah, well, first of all, um, uh, NFTs, cryptocurrency, blockchain, there there can be an MLM connection. Um, uh, and the, the last case I was on with the Federal Trade Commission, um, the firm uh, positioned itself as sort of crowdsourcing and investing and it was just a crypto multi-level marketing pyramid scheme. Mm -hmm. um, but NFTs, uh, I find them to be um, uh, curious. And, and the one thing that they share with an MLM is they got to keep you believing. Because the value of that, you can call it art, you can call it whatever it is. I don't care if it's, you know, Snoop Dogg's memorabilia. The value of that is all subjective. And so right. we need to make sure that you really buy into this. And um, the uh, <laughs> I find it to be surprising. And um, this is an area where men will, for lack of a better word, screw each other. Well, 100%, because, I mean, it doesn't quite have the same structure as a pyramid scheme in a lot of cases, but it has that aspect of hot potato in terms of not being the last one holding it. Um, it... it you got to pass it off to someone. Not only that, uh, I can hike the value. So suppose I own an NFT that I, that I paid $5,000 for. Suppose I very quickly borrow 
$10,000 in crypto. We're going to do this fast. So it doesn't cost me too much interest. I'm going to give that $10,000 to you. Mm -hmm. You buy that NFT from me for $9,500. You keep the 500, right? Mm -hmm. I pay off my loan. I now have an NFT that's worth $9,500. Right. Where two days ago, it was worth $5,000. Easy, easy peasy. And I can do it again. Yeah, it's funny because I feel I do feel a strong sense of empathy for the stay at home moms getting targeted by essential oils and very little for, you know, the bros on Reddit, you know, hoodwinking each other, partially because I think there's something about the NFT market in particular and the cryptocurrency. I don't have the data on this. Maybe you do. But it doesn't seem to as often be coming out of a place of total financial desperation. It seems to be coming more from a, uh, wanting to game the system in some way. Yeah, yeah, financial foolishness. Right, you know, and, you know, similar to day trading and things like that. People who want to, you know, right. get there quickly. Right. Yeah, and I want to just go back for a moment, if I may, to, to the issue of, of, of young mothers and, and, and women in general. Uh, I think that that um, I would really, really encourage people, uh, young women, to look into their, their own selves, into their own interests, find something that you just can't read enough about and learn more about it and, and find a way to add value. I mean, it's clearly what you have done here. It's what other people have done. Um, you know, when I, I see former students who, when I had them in class, they didn't know what they were doing. And then I see them three or four years later and they found it. Oh, 100%. You know, and so it, it, it's some of the answer is coming from inside. Of course. What I mean, also, I mean, as as bleak as it is to say, I mean, listen, if you already are about to have a kid or have a kid, that ship has sailed. But if you haven't yet, this is why, you know, planning for a family as first and foremost a financial decision is the most important thing you can possibly do. <laughs> After you have children, you'll wonder where your money and your time went. There you go. For sure. <laughs> but I mean, I do think there's, you know, it's strange to me that as much as there's an emphasis, you know, on having a perfect wedding and, you know, your soulmate and love and obviously the next step is having kids. Is it? Right. Well, actually, that's a good point. And, and I mean, my own personal history is I got married at 19 and my wife and I were like, boy, we just this is just too young to think about kids. So we didn't have any children for five years and we did it purposely. Yeah. Um, and, and that was back in the day, so to speak. Um, and I think that, you know, I would encourage anyone to think about this. It, it's the having a child and raising a child brings so much more uncertainty into your life because you're hoping you're doing it right and you're learning a lot of different things. Um, so that let's let's get things settled and let's get a, a, a sense of that. I don't. I think if you're waiting to be financially secure to have children, you just will never have them. But I think if you have a sense of your finance, you know, right? Then I think, and you have a sense of where you will be three years from now, then I think that 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 makes a lot of sense. Sure. I mean, I don't listen. I'm not saying you need to have you know a million dollars in the bank to have a kid, but I do think the part of listen fair or not and it's not we have a very very thin social safety net particularly for young parents and particularly on top of that for young mothers um so to not plan the decision out from a financial perspective as detailed as you would you know what you know you're painting the nursery you're buying all the binkies like but what are you doing with you know your income right it, it, yeah it, it's very very difficult to 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 get someone to appreciate what happens once you have a child in terms of what happens to your finances and what happens to your time and, and what happens to your emotional connections and what happens to your options. It's very difficult. Um, and uh, so you, you, they, after a while, your options foreclose. Right. right. I mean, I went back to get my PhD with a four-year-old and a nine-year-old. Most people wouldn't do that. And it took five years. Out of curiosity, what was your wife doing at that time? She was working her butt off as a medical transcriptionist. Wow. Um, and making it work. Making it work. And uh, when I approached her with the idea, I said, here's the thing. I want to quit my job. You will have to get a job because she at the time was just working part time. You'll have to work full time. It's going to take five years and we'll have to borrow $20,000. And she said, no. <laughs> she said, that's not a good idea. I said, I, I really think it can be. And we talked about it. 
And um, we bought a really crummy old farmhouse because we could afford it. And I went to back to school and got the PhD and everything changed. What a great story. We love long-term life partners who made it work. Well, we celebrate 50 next summer. 50 years together? <laughs> That's so wonderful. Aw. Shout out to Bill's wife. Um, okay. Do the people who sell for MLMs actively realize they're scamming the people they're selling to? Yes. Thank you. Um, mm. Are there honest MLM members who are aware of the harms that MLMs can, perpetu can perpetuate and who would speak candidly about it, do you think? We've seen some of that. Um, we've seen some of that um, in the anti-MLM movement. Um, and we've seen some of that came out in the uh, Lula Rich documentary mm -hmm. based on Lula Rowe. Um, so we've seen some of it. Um, and uh, we need to see more. Um, we, we need just as there are people drawing people into MLMs, right. there are people who have experienced MLMs that can warn people about them, that can, that can let them know what goes on behind the curtain, of what gets said when they're not around. Um, and, and I think that's a really important aspect of this. And uh, uh, I'm, you know, I'm in connection with a few people in the anti-MLM movement, and uh, they've been thoughtful. Um, they've been caring about, uh, about getting their messages out. Uh, you have to be very careful. This is a very litigious industry. They will sue yeah. you in a minute. This is maybe more of a subjective question, but is attempting to recruit for an MLM a reasonable cause to end a friendship or to at least distance yourself substantially? I would go with the distance yourself. Here's the thing. It's not going to get better. Right. So, so the longer that friend stays in the MLM, the, the, the greater the chance that this is not going to end well with your relationship right. anyhow. Um, and uh, again, I, I think that, um, you know, w w when we see someone get involved with something that we care about, um, you know, uh, we want the best for them. We recognize they may not be in a place where they're listening. Um, I think that what the best we can do is to, to tell them that, you know, it's not for us and that um, from what you heard, it takes a lot of time and money and that if, if nothing else, uh, are they keeping track of their time and money? And I, I think um, if we can encourage them to do that um, and, and, and let them find a, a time uh, when they may be willing to talk more about it. Um, but it can be difficult when someone is committed, when someone spent thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, there's an embarrassment issue there. Um, sure. And I think that um, we really, uh, it's hard. If you've got five friends in MLM, you're going to lose some of them forever. Yeah, I had a person extremely close to me who was in a very vulnerable position and a friend was really coming at her hardcore to join this extremely expensive MLM. I think it was like $5,000 just to start. And I wanted to sue that person into the ground. I was like, how dare you? How dare you? Because the thing is, as you said, they know what they're doing yes, to they this do. person. And to try and put them in a deep financial hole in such a vulnerable time, it's to me, it's really hard to get over that, even though in your earlier framing, they are still victims. They are. And I think, you know, as you had mentioned earlier, I mean, if this is the American way, then shame on us. Shame on us. Uh, if, 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 our, if we take pride in... in, in uh, getting people involved in things that they cannot succeed at and they, that cost their families thousands of dollars and that takes a big chunk out of their self-esteem, if that's what it takes, I think that's a problem. I totally agree. As a last question, um, oh, actually, sorry, two more questions. What is the difference between affiliate marketing and multi-level marketing? I'd have to see it a little more in context, but potentially no difference at all. I think, at least from my experience, one of the differences in affiliate marketing is that there's often no startup cost. It's just you promote this thing and you get paid when you sell. Yeah, that's right. I, terms get moved around. Um, so I've, I've seen the term affiliate marketing used in the context of MLM, 
but I think it could not be as well. Um, and, and so I would take it, it, the example you gave would not be an MLM example. Right. I think it can still be predatory in its way, and it definitely can be exploitative to the people who are participating in it. But in that sense, it's, it's not. Um, why do intelligent people still fall for MLMs? Because they think they're smart. There it is. Well, Bill, thank you so much for joining us. Um, where can people go to read more of your writing and to follow a little bit of what you do? Um, uh, I have a lot of pieces out on Seeking Alpha, um, uh, and I've been writing about, uh, started about Herbalife in particular, but also about the MLM industry in general. Some of my pieces have been complimentary to the FTC. Some of them have been critical to the FTC. Uh, we've had a conference. We're going to have another conference that we'll be promoting. It's open to the public. It'll be a, a Zoom webinar type conference. Um, and if you want more information or if you have questions, uh, my last name is Keep. My email is keep at tcnj.edu. Send me a note. Um, and if I need to connect you with someone, I, there's a network of lawyers out there. There's a lot of people out there, the anti-MLM people. I'd be happy to make that connection. I love that. It's also a very academic thing to encourage people to just email you directly. Sure, why not? I love that. Well, thank you so much for joining thank us again. You. And thank you guys all for tuning in. We will see you next Monday on a brand new episode of The Financial Confessions. Bye. Bye.